us uh, this evening for the November 6, 2023 Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. It is now 8 o'clock according to this, but 7 o'clock, so we'll, uh, we'll get our meeting started. If you would, please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Comments of public interest. This portion of the meeting is to allow up to three minutes per speaker with 30 total minutes on items of interest or concern and not on items that are on the current agenda. The Planning and Zoning Commission may not discuss these <coughs> items but may respond with factual or policy information. The Planning and Zoning Commission may choose to place the item on a future agenda. The presiding officer may modify these times as deemed necessary. Thank you. Do we have any speakers on this item? No, we do not. Thank you. Let's move to consent. The consent agenda will be acted upon in one motion and contains items which are routine and typically non-controversial. Items may be removed from this agenda for individual consideration by commissioners or staff. Thank you. It's my understanding we're going to remove item C from the consent for consideration, and during that time, uh, Commissioner Lyle needs to recuse himself as well. So anyone want to remove any other items for the agenda? <coughs> Seeing none. I move we pr approve the consent agenda with item C removed as submitted. Second. So I have a motion by Commissioner Bronski with a second by Commissioner Brunoff to approve the consent agenda. <laughs> Minus item C, please vote. That item carries eight to zero. So Commissioner Law, if you'd like to recuse yourself and please read item C. Consent agenda item C, revised site plan. South side 14th Street edition, block A, lot one. Restaurant, three multifamily residence units, professional general administrative office, and health fitness center on one lot on .3 acre located on the south side of 14th Street, 125 feet east of K Avenue. Zone downtown business government. The applicant is east side 14th Street, LLC. Good evening, commissioners. I'm Parker McDowell, planner with the planning department. Uh, the commission may approve this item as shown with the corrections during the preliminary open meeting, or they may table it to the 1120 meeting, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Riley, you're okay. I don't see any questions. Okay, so no questions. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ratliff. Uh, I'd like to make a motion we approve item C as presented with the substitution of the um, site plan, revised site plan as presented to us in preliminary open meeting. Second. Thank you. All right. So I have a motion by Commissioner Ratliff with a second by Commissioner Bronski to approve item C subject to the changes that were presented to us in preliminary open meeting. If you would please vote. And Mr. Ali, thank you. And that item carries seven to zero with one um, abstention. Yes, thank you. Conflict. Very good. All right. Uh, let's move on. Items for individual consideration, public hearing items. Unless instructed otherwise by the chair, speakers will be called in the order reg registrations are received. Applicants are limited to a total of 15 minutes of presentation time with a five-minute rebuttal if needed. Remaining speakers are limited to 30 total minutes of testimony time with three minutes assigned per speaker. The presiding officer may modify these times as deemed necessary. Administrative consideration items must be approved if they meet city development regulations. Legislative consideration items are more discretionary except as constrained by legal considerations. Agenda items number 1A and 1B will be uh, presented together. Public hearing, zoning case 2023-006. This, this is a request for a specific use permits for private club and food truck park on 0.8 acre located 524 feet north of Park, Bull, 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 uh, sorry, <laughs> park Boulevard and 940 feet east of Preston Road. Petitioner is Amrit SSPF Preston Gold LP. This is for legislative consideration. <coughs> 
They also have a revised site plan, Preston Town Crossing, Block 1, Lot 2, Retail Medical Office, Health Fitness Center, Restaurant, Private Club, and Food Truck Park on one lot on eight acres located on the north side of Park Boulevard, 760 feet east of Preston Road, zoned retail with specific use <laughs> permit number 564 for private club lo and located within the Preston Road Overlay District. Again, the ap applicant is Amri SSPF Preston Gold LP, and this is for administrative consideration. Good evening, everyone. Before we get started, Plano TV, can you please uh, move to slide seven? Uh, to clarify agenda number 1A. <coughs> Thank you. We also Good. have, hang on a second. Can we get rid of the unmute? The host would like you to unmute, unmute. I don't know where that's coming from. Yeah, it's the Zoom. I don't know who's controlling the Zoom. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Katja Copeland, and I'm senior planner with the planning department. This request is for two SUPs for a private club and for a food truck park in an existing shopping center. On the screen highlighted in yellow is the subject property. To the north, the property is zoned multifamily residence three and is developed with multifamily residences. To the south, the property is zoned retail with specific use permits 92 and number 488 for private club and is developed with a shopping center with retail, personal service shop, and restaurant uses. To the east, the property is zoned retail and is developed with a parking lot that serves the existing shopping center and a regional theater. To the west, the property is zoned retail with specific use permit number 564 for a private club. A revised site plan for the property accompanies this request as item number 1B. It is shown on the screen. The subject property is designated Suburban Activity Center on the future land use map. The designation supports entertainment uses such as food truck parks and private clubs to create a destination, shopping, and entertainment centers. Staff finds the request for a private club and food truck park consistent with the comprehensive plan. There are four approved specific use permits for private clubs within the proximity to the property shown on the screen. The subject property is highlighted in green and the SUPs are highlighted in yellow. Today, it does not appear that any of the four locations are operating as a private club. At the October 2nd Planning and Zoning Commission meeting, staff requested that this item be tabled due to continuing discussions with the applicant regarding off-street parking. The outstanding parking questions have been resolved. If approved, the applicant will be required to enter into a parking agreement with the property to the west. This is noted as a condition of approval on the revised site plan. Food truck parks are subject to compliance with the residential adjacency standards of Article 21 of the Zoning Ordinance. The proposed food truck park is 1,600 square feet and approximately 275 feet from the adjacent MF3 zoning to the north, which exceeds the 150-foot requirement per Article 21. To provide additional protection to nearby residents, staff recommends a 250-foot separation requirement as a stipulation. Additionally, the stipulation continues to include a 50-foot separation from the eastern property line. This is to consider any future development of that property. With this stipulation, staff supports the food truck park. We received no responses within 200 feet. And we received nine total responses, six in support and three in opposition. To summarize, the applicant is requesting two specific use permits, one for a private club and for a food truck park in an existing shopping center. Staff finds the request for a private club and food truck park consistent with the comprehensive plan and the suburban activity center category. Staff recommends approval of item 1A and 1B with restrictions listed on the screen related to the food truck park 
and to the companion revised site plan. The applicants are here tonight with a presentation and that concludes my presentation and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. I didn't mean to sound like Elvis. Um, <laughs> are there any questions, technical questions for staff on this item? Uh, Mr. Brunoff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to make sure that I understand correctly the staff is recommending approval with restrictions for a 250-foot setback from the residential zoning district to the north and a minimum of 50 feet from the eastern property line of the Preston Town Crossing, Block 1, Lot 2, and also subject to entering into an agreement for 47 parking spaces off-site. Is that correct? Yes, 250 feet to the north, 50 feet from the east, and entering yeah. into a parking agreement with the property to the west. Okay, so our motion, if we decide to approve it, should include those conditions. Yes. Just to clarify, yeah. the, the separation is for the SUP. The condition parking for the parking is on the site plan. Yeah. Okay, so that's 1A versus 1B, correct? Correct. Right. Got it. But you, you did say all those stipulations that were listed. Yes, yes. thank you. Any other questions, uh, Commissioner Ali? The 50 feet um, areas, that's to the, well, apologies for my voice. On the east, it's, uh, the designation is for retail. Is, do we have, I don't think we do, but do we have any setback requirements for a food truck or this kind of um, use from a retail? Are we just in, in, imposing a 50 feet um, setback or um, to this particular, do we have anything in, our, in the zoning ordinance that requires a setback from a, re a retail designation from another essentially retail restaurant designation? For this case, the RAS only applies to the north. And so Correct. with the 50 foot um, to the east that we're implementing is for the food truck park to be more defined on the revised site plan. In addition, we are considering future development of that eastern property to have that buffer from the food truck park. What mechanism do we have to enforce the parking agreement? So if the um, <clears throat> entity that they have to get into an agreement with refuses to get into an agreement, what what's a mechanism to does this blow up, essentially? Um, what's our mechanism to enforce that? Is there an agreement in, in <clears throat> spirit already in place? Um, I'm just trying to understand how, if we vote using the stipulation and we've not gone along the lines of ensuring that we get that, what's the mechanism that this body has to make that happen? Sure, and I think those questions are exactly why it was tabled on October 2nd, was we needed to figure those items out. Now, the property owner owns a <coughs> lot of properties within this northeast corner, and so it, the property owner for this lot will be unable to obtain their certificate of occupancy unless that parking agreement has been reviewed and approved by the city. Just to, to clarify, the adjacent property owner is the same owner as this site? Is the same Correct. I think it's worth, the question is valuable in understanding though that if we approved an SUP that's with the property and if this person wasn't able to get that parking, they could negotiate or another uh, owner could eventually negotiate something to make that work. So approving the SUP subject to a parking agreement, if that doesn't happen, that doesn't mean that the SUP goes away. It just means that they can't get their certificate of, certificate of occupancy and upgrade. Okay, we still have several more questions. That was a good technical question, so let's make sure that they're technical because we still have a presentation from the uh, applicant. Mr. Lyle? Does the residential adjacency standard apply to the private club or only to the food truck park? Food truck park. And not the private club? No. And Do you have other distant requirements for hospitals, schools? and this request is meeting those. And the language in the residential adjacency standard, I standards, I believe it talks about associated uses. Are, has staff determined that the food truck park is not an associated use to the private club? 
so the RAS does not apply to private clubs, therefore we did not apply it. There are two separate SUPs. So we're applying the residential adjacency standard only to the SUP for the food truck. Right, but the letter, if, if you read the residential adjacency standard, doesn't it say where there's multiple uses on a site, it's to be applied to associated uses? I had to clarify that, but I think in the intent in this case is that the food truck operations are could could be standalone from the private club. And so in this case, we're applying it only to the food truck park. Two permits. Yeah, they're not they're not required to be built built together, CO'd together, permitted together. They're completely standalone. Are they associated is the question though. They're associated only in the fact that they are presented together for um, ease of consideration by the PNZ, but they could be standalone on their own. Okay, and just to let the commission know where I'm, well, I guess this might not be the time to explain where I'm going. Let's just okay. get technical yep. okay. staff so we can move on. Mr. Ratliff. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just a clarifying question. If we already have a RAS of 150 feet to a residential district that they're meeting, what is the rationale about ex about making that stricter at 250 other than they still meet it? But is there a reason why we are writing that into the PD? Additional protection for those residents to the north. Okay, so we're just, it, it's purely about just making sure that we don't end up sliding it further south at this point that they, but wouldn't they have to modify the site plan if they wanted to do that in the future? Or would, that, would they be able to move that if they, if we didn't change the distance? Sure, so the food truck park recommendation is to have that distance. And that's with the zoning. So yes, the, the site plan shows the designated area for the food truck park. So should they ask to change that, they would need to come back to the site plan process. So long as they meet those separation just requirements of the SUP, they can move it somewhere else, but they can't get any closer than those setbacks without coming back through to amend the SUP. Okay, so if we didn't change the distance then they could just do a site plan amendment. If they wanted to move it closer, once we put this in, they'd have to come back for an SUP amendment, which is a little bigger product. Okay. Correct. That's what I was trying to understand why we were doing that. So, okay. Thank you very much. Commissioner Kerry. Yes. So I think what you just said is that the 250 feet is to provide protection for the neighbors to the north for the food trucks, right? Correct. So is it the staff's position or belief that that same type of protection shouldn't be required for the larger facility? And I guess I would, I'm curious why the food trucks would need more protection than the larger facility. I guess I'm trying to understand that thinking. Sure, food truck parks you can enjoy outdoors and this revised site plan does show a canopy and an outdoor seating area that's towards the south end of the property. And so with the exposure of the food truck park, having that extra protection um, has staff thinking about the residents and having that extra 100 feet. And if I could add, the, the food truck park has noise, um, running vehicles, generators, things like that, that are associated with it, that essentially the residential adjacency standards are largely about noise close to residential districts. The applicant proposed this location, and so just to cement that into the what they asked for is the reason that is 250 feet. Okay, thank you. Okay, no more lights up. Thank you. Thank Great you. job. Appreciate it. Okay, uh, if we have no more questions of staff, I will open the public hearing. And yes, we, have we, the applicant. Ha we do. We have the applicant, Tommy Mann. Good evening, Tommy Mann, 500 Winstead Building in Dallas. Uh, happy to share with you tonight uh, some further information about this proposed tenant for Preston Town Crossing. My client is Edens. They actually own 50 acres at this corner. Uh, so the discussion about the agreement will be with ourselves. With me tonight is Michael Hale, who's actually been in charge of the leasing for this property since 2007. Uh, they are long-term holders of retail real estate all over the country and this uh, he can obviously answer a lot of specific questions you might have about how we ended up where we are today. Uh, just a little bit of background and then I'll tell you more about the proposed tenant. So obviously you know where we are proposing within the site. This center today is far from dead. There are parts of it that are thriving over primarily <coughs> along the Preston frontage with REI and Trader Joe's and we're thrilled with that. But as you kind of 
turn to the south and the east and you've been back there, it gets a little tougher. Uh, and we've had trouble leasing these areas. Cowboys, this actual box was originally a target back in the early 2000s. They left and moved. Uh, an antique mall came in for a little bit. That didn't go great. Uh, Gold's Gym came in. They got crushed by the hailstorm uh, and vacated. And now Cowboys Fit has taken a chunk of it and is starting to gain some momentum there. But we still have this large portion of the box that has remained vacant. So the concept that we're proposing to put in here is actually – uh, there are three of these locations in Houston. It's called Kirby Ice House, if you've ever been to one. There's one of the Woodlands Memorial and a third one. It's a Houston area-based family uh, with experience in development that has opened this concept. The idea is kind of a front porch for the neighborhood. It's a dog-friendly venue uh, set up kind of with an indoor-outdoor vibe, good place to watch the game, good place to have a corporate event, good place to meet friends uh, for happy hour or go after the movie or before the movie next door. Uh, but it's also for Eden's about vitalizing this center a little bit. I mean, we've got to find ways with, you know, this corner has like a million square feet of retail. And we've got to make it an experience that is worth coming to. Otherwise, you can order what you need right now while you're listening to me talk, and it'll be on your porch tomorrow, right? Uh, but if you create a venue where people get to hang out and socialize and enjoy their time, they're more likely to also walk around the center and visit the other tenants. So the other tenants are excited about this concept going in here, uh, and we think it'll be a great boost for the center overall. These are just photos of the other locations in Houston that I mentioned. Uh, the food park, uh, the food truck park element, I'll talk a little bit on on the plan and how this one's a little different than what's in Houston, but you see folks with their dogs sitting outside and inside. So at the other locations in Houston, the only food service is provided by the food trucks. Here, we will have the food trucks in the area you see in green. There'll be two most of the time, maybe three. Uh, but we will also have a kitchen that is preparing and serving meals internal to the facility in the area in blue at this location, which we don't have in Houston, and that's to meet the requirements of Plano for food sales, uh, and we think it's going to work well here. Some of the questions about the distance, yeah, there wasn't more thinking to it other than this is where it is, so we were happy to make that uh, concession. And then the rest of the use, what you see in blue is enclosed. So as far as the, no the noise, and that's within the existing building, the kind of open air portion of it's on the southern end where the food truck is and can't be. And so that, that part is obviously the portion that is farthest away from the residential. So overall, we're, we're perfectly happy with staff's conditions, uh, and we're happy to answer any specific questions. We're excited about this use if you uh, move it forward. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any other speakers on this item? No, we do not. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mann. Would you hold on one second? I, sure. I see a couple of questions that are coming up. Uh, Commissioner Bronski, do you have a question? Yeah, I just want to clarify what we were talking about earlier. The uh, private club in blue and the food truck in green are, in fact, separate. Uh, blue, the blue is not in any way dependent on the green or vice versa. If you're there having dinner or drink, you're not going to be able to tell the difference, right? Um, but the food trucks themselves can be operated by third-party food truck owners. The kitchen within the blue area will be owned and operated by Kirby itself. But if you're there, it's all an integrated experience. It's definitely part of the vibe, if you will, to have both. So I'm just trying to make sure that could, we were told a minute ago that the requirements of the residential adjacency didn't weren't part of the blue because it was not connected to the green. And so I'm asking you, are they separate? I think they're legally separate. They're two separately classified uses that require their own SUPs. So in zoning runs with the land, totally agree with staff on that. I think it's unlikely that Kirby would sell off the food truck operation and only operate the club. It's likely to remain integrated the whole time it's in business, but I think legally, technically, they could be separate. That's what I wanted to hear. Thank you. Yep. Commissioner Tong. I have had the same question regarding the relationship between the blue box and the green box. So my, my, understand, my understanding right now is that actually Kirby Ice House will be operating both the blue box and the green box. However, legally, the green box can be leased out to somebody else. Yeah, so the food trucks may come in. Maybe the simplest way to answer it, Kirby will be renting 
leasing everything you see here from Eaton's. Got you. They'll so Kirby will be running both places. Yes, they'll be managing and operating it, but you can have a third party's food truck come in for two weeks or whatever from a different restaurant that makes and serves their own food, but it'll be managed by Kirby. Got you. Thank you. Commissioner Carey. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, so are the, the food trucks um, necessary for this whole thing to work? I mean, if if you didn't get approval for the food truck zoning, what would happen to the project? I don't think Kirby would go forward in their lease because that's their business model. And these kind of these photos that I showed you, you can see that's what they've done at their three existing locations. Um, it's, it's about the vibe, frankly, and it's about the sense of community that they think it fosters mm -hmm. and they think it's cool to have the food trucks. And it's integral to the what they're trying to, the experience they're trying to create for customers. So I do think, not if I'm incorrect, but they, they need them to operate. Okay, yeah. thank you. Mr. Law. <coughs> is the yellow, it says proposed canopy area. Mm -hmm. Is that currently where there's building? Or Yeah, there's some building there and there's a couple little tenants and thank you, I should have mentioned that. So there's like a little, Jim, a dentist, and a sporting goods tenant in there. They are relocating to other vacancies in the center. And then that facade will be altered to create kind of an indoor-outdoor vibe as opposed to what it is today. I mean, I drove the site this morning or this afternoon, and I thought this was like adventure. It is. It is right okay. there. They're going to move to a different spot in the center. Okay. There's also a little dentist in there. And, uh, and so y'all are going to take that front facade and open it up and make it feel, gotcha. Correct. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Brunoff. He just answered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the private club, the blue area, in order to patronize that, I assume you would have to be a, a member of the club. You have to join as a member. Is that right? That's regulated by the TABC, right? And that's how the, they regulate the ability to right. sell alcohol, okay. so yes. So my question is, since the green area is co-operated <coughs> by the same people that are operating the private club, do you have to be a, a member in order to patronize the food trucks, or is that open to the general public? I think anybody could go in there and order. I think when you'll be, my experience yeah. is mm -hmm. probably the same as yours. If you try to order a beer, you're going to have to join the private club. But if you want to go in there and buy a meal, that's my, I think you'll be able to buy a meal. No, I, I don't mean go into the blue area. I mean, it, can I, as a non-member of the private club, buy a sandwich from, from the food truck, for example? I think you can. Yeah. Sorry, that I don't know for sure exactly. And I'm not sure that Kirby knows exactly how that's going to operate. But they're not intending to keep people who are shopping in the center from coming over and having lunch. Right. In other words, the food truck is not part of the private club. Right. It is a separate use. It will have its own CO and its own parking requirement, but okay. you will feel like you're in the same establishment if you're All right. in there. Thank you. Okay. I don't see any more questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And we had no more speakers, you said? No, we do not. All right. I'll close the public <laughs> hearing to find discussion of the commission. Um, to me, it looks like in a kind of a, a fun vibe. It's a little bit of a... I mean, across the street, I think, is what Katie Ice House. So a little competition for them. Um, it's my understanding for the private club is that if you order alcohol, you have to join. But if you're, just, if you're not, then I don't think there's a requirement for it. And we've been back and forth on that. Commissioner Carey. Yeah, um, I echo your comments. Um, this is, I, I live not too far from here, so I know this area really well. And I've, I've uh, been over to Katie Ice House or the other Katie Trail numerous times and it's it's a great establishment um i like i like this project um and i think it's good for the area um and i've talked to i went and talked to a number of business owners including the people over at katie trail um to see what they thought um as they're already operating there you know and and they were positive about this coming into the area um the only thing that concerns me and it's really for us not them is how we're managing these separate sups and it feels constructed to me, and I, I guess I don't like it. Um, and and I, I, it seems to me we should be able to find a more straightforward way. This, to me, is all one business. And it feels like we're bifurcating it here somehow, and something about it just doesn't feel right to me. Um, and, and maybe it's because if we don't do that, then the residential adjacent standards are going to be violated 
Um, and, and I think that's okay. And then maybe we just, in my opinion, then just need to give them exemption for that. But I just feel like this is a bit constructed and I don't understand why. And so, but I'm for this project. I just, I think the other thing is maybe on our side. And so I'm confused by that. That's my whole thing. Commissioner Riley. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I've got family down in Houston. I have to admit, I may have been to a Kirby Ice House more than once, uh, and it does have a very unique vibe. So uh, when I read this case and saw it was Kirby Ice House, I have to admit that it was a pretty easy sell because y'all have a great thing going down there. And if y'all bring that to Plano, I'm excited about it. Um, uh, I, I, I do. I, I guess I'm, I understand that y'all agree to the 250 foot setback. I don't see why it's necessary, but I don't, you know, I don't, it's not worth living or dying over. Um, and um, I guess I get why they're separate uses because there'll be different COs and different tenants, basically, because the food trucks will be a different tenant, quote unquote. But not, not really. Not yeah, really. Not yeah, and that's, I'm, I'm kind of confused about that too. I don't have a problem with it either way. Um, and I'm supportive of the project. So if that's the way the staff thinks it's the cleanest to, to present it, uh, I'd, I'd like to understand it a little more, but I don't see it. I'm not opposed to it because it's done that way. Let's hear from staff. If I could clarify. So it was brought up about associated activity. It's not associated uses, it's associated activity. So an associated activity with a food truck park would be like the seating area. That would be subject to the adjacency standards. But it also applies to accessory uses. In this case, the private club is not accessory to the food truck park. They're two separate primary uses that are happening to be operated by the same business, and they will functionally work the same but they are two standalone uses, could be permitted separately, CO'd separately. From a zoning perspective, they are separate uses. Mr. Bronski. So I understand, I, I get the idea that they're separate uses, but from what it sounded like to me, from the people operating it, uh, there's not a way for them to operate the blue without the green. Is that, I mean, that, that was kind of what I, I, I got the impression that if both of them did not come together, that they would not, they would not I be able to. I think that's a decision made by the uh, potential tenant versus yeah, the property owner. But that was a, was a question I'd asked them. And that was, the, so I struggle with the idea that they're, they're as integral, intricately connected um, as described by the um, so, gentleman speaking. So I'd suggest we, we get past some of the structure and operation there. Staff is recommending something they think is the cleanest way for us to make a decision on this. And for us, from a land use standpoint, do we like the idea of this being here? If somebody, anybody else came and said, we're going to open up the private club. Oh, and by the way, we're going to potentially open up this canopy area. Would we think that's a good use of this land? No, I, and I understand that. And okay. I get the... Uh, I guess it would have been if they had been able to. No, I'm. I get it. it. But it just seems to me they're a little more intricately connected, and the way that it's. Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm done. Sorry. Okay. We got lots of comments here, um, Mr. Lau. Is there any way around the residential adjacency standards, like a variance? But but. I'm, I'm, why are we asking for that? Well, I'm asking for it because the language of the residential adjacency standards includes associated uses. And if I'm having a sandwich in the green box and I want a beer, I get it from the blue box. And so I know staff has said these things aren't associated, they're different. But in my mind, they're very associated. And so I support the project. I'm for the project. I just want to get there in a way that makes sense. And saying that they're not associated doesn't make sense to me. They seem very associated to me. And so I'm asking staff, can we get there with another mechanism that essentially varies the standard instead of waves our wand and acts like we met the standard? There is no intent to bypass residential adjacency standards in this instance. They are two separate uses in the use table. They are both require an SUP, but only one requires compliance with residential adjacency standards. I would say that you are, you are mistaken in saying it's an associated use. It's an associated activity. 
with the food truck park. So, and again, can you as, help as me presented? understand the difference in a use yes. and an activity? Yes, exactly. So, associated activity again, a food truck park would be the seating that goes with the food truck park, where people are supposed to sit, not just the truck itself. That's an associated activity. If I want a beer in the green box, if I'm sitting in the green box and I want a beer, I go to the blue box. This is an SUP. You're welcome to apply residential adjacency standards in this instance if you wish. But the way the zoning ordinance is constructed, it is not required for the private club. Right. The, the, it's, association, it's the association in this case is a business model, not a zoning model. That's the difference. That's the I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask us again, because I see all the, all the questions here. Let's not tear apart the way this application is done and look instead at, is the use appropriate? I think he's explained it twice. The, the private club itself isn't dealing with residential adjacency standards. This use is. We're outside the requirements of our residential adjacency standards. The applicant has agreed to a 250-foot setback, which is further than is even required. So I think we're we're, uh, we're, we're tearing something apart here, because if we were to try to say, well, let's figure out a different way to do it, we're telling them they got to go away and come back and do a new application. There's got to be a whole other process done. So I, I want us to, again, focus here. Is this a good use for this property? And what I've heard so far is, yes, we're just not sure we understand how this is going about. Okay, that's why we have staff who understands our ordinance better than any of us will and the best way to get to a good project. So again, is this a good use of the land? Commissioner Tong. Thank you, Chairman. My question is actually related to the site plan. Uh, that's the uh, second part of the application. So the change, can you actually point out the exact change of the site plan? I know there's a food truck area that's more than that it was before, but if you look at the site plan, it just looks like it's still the, the original line and including the parking. I don't see that little um, food truck area that's kind of bumped out, like the yellow line area. <clears throat> is that included in the new site plan? Right, so this is a, a change in use as well as adding the food truck park location. Were it just a private club, it would be, um, we'd come to this SUP process, but it wouldn't have any changes to the building itself, if that makes sense. So we're okay, really just so updating the for the parking plan. requirements, make sure all that's complied with, as well as the food truck park location. So the shaded site plan does not include that little 1,600 square feet foot truck area, does it? It does, it does. It's the green. It's adjacent it to the proposed it. canopy area. Yeah, it does show it in there. There's a proposed 1,600 foot square foot food truck parking location. Okay, it's including, it's, yes, it's outside of that entire area. Right. Okay, um, so if you're, applying two different SUPs or two different areas, um, is there any needs or necessary, or is it necessary to separate them because there are two different SUPs applied to them? Yeah, that, that's exactly why staff is recommending they be separated. So we're, at, we're making one recommendation for the private club and a separate recommendation for the food truck park. They will go down as two separate specific use permits num numbers if they're approved. Would that be reflected on the side plan or no? Uh, not on the side plan, no. Not on the side plan. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Ali. Not a question, more of a comment. Um, <clears throat> and if I get this wrong, please uh, jump in. We're essentially looking at a piece of dirt, right? And by right, because it's designated retail, um, they do not have the right to use this as a private club and or uh, food truck, which is why they apply for the SUP. Yeah. So the land use that they are applying for to add a right that is not given to them by right for a private club, which they've met all of their in compliance with uh, the comp plan. And for the food truck, they've met the residential adjacency standards, which is the only 
SUP that requires a residential adjacent standard applied to it, the business model doesn't matter. They're asking, can we use this land with this right attached to it? It so happens that this also um, achieves the priorities that we have for our suburban activity centers yes. in terms of creating destination shopping, entertainment yes. centers, and a thoughtful use of mix. Yes. This is, to me, as straight shot an approval as I have seen in a while, and um, I move, we approve item 1A and B, pending okay. Commissioner Brunoff. <laughs> Um, so we still have some more comments that someone wants to make uh, since we can have comments after a motion. So I have a motion to approve item 1A. Do I have a second on item 1A? Um, the motion should be conditioned, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Uh, that's correct. Do you want to make that motion subject to the conditions in the... I move we approve item 1A subject to the conditions stipulated by staff. Thank you. Second. All right, so now I have a motion and a second. Do we have more discussion around item 1A? Okay, very good. So with that, please vote on item 1A. That item carries eight to zero. Can I get a motion on item 1B? Mr. Chairman? Yes. I make a motion we approve item 1B with the uh, provision that um, the applicant enter into an agreement for additional off-street parking as specified in, uh, by staff. Uh, do we also need to condition this Subject on city council approval. approval of the yes. underlying zoning case, which I also move? As I'll I include that as part of your now. motion. Second. So I have a motion by Commissioner Brunoff on item 1B <laughs> with a second by Commissioner Bronski to approve item 1B subject to <coughs> approval of the zoning case and the, uh, pro the parking agreement, shared parking agreement. Commissioner Law, there you go. And that item carries eight to zero. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone for their patience. Item two. I will pres uh, a, B, read C. two A, B, and C together. Public Hearing Zoning Case 2023-024, Request for a Specific Use Permit for Public Service Yard on 5.2 acres located 325 feet north of Technology Drive and 700 feet west of Shiloh Road. Uh, it's currently zoned Research Technology Center. Petitioner is Dallas Area Rapid Transit. This is for legislative consideration. Preliminary Site Plan, 2B is Shiloh Layover Facility, public service yard on 5.2 acres located 325 feet north of Technology Drive and 250 feet west of Klein Road. Again, the applicant is Dallas Area Rapid Transit. This is for administrative consideration. Item 2C is a revised preliminary site plan. Hematronics Edition, Block A, Lot 1R. Office showroom warehouse on one lot on 2.2 acres located on the north side of Technology Drive, 1,000 feet west of Klein Road. Applicant is Burlington Ventures, LLC. This is for administrative consideration. Thank you, Ms. Bridges. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. I'm Raha Pulati, the planner with the planning and department. This is a request for a SUP um, for a public service yard within the DART right-of-way. The request would allow DART to construct a maintenance building, a wash building, and an open-air fueling canopy. The subject property is located within the Research Technology Zoning District and is highlighted in yellow. The base zoning for the property to the north is light commercial and are developed with a variety of um, institutional and commercial uses. The properties to the east are zone research technology center with a specific use permit for transit station and electrical substation and are developed accordingly. The properties to the south 
our zoned RT and are developed with distribution center, warehouse, professional general administrative office, and light intensity manufacturing. The property to the west is zone RT and is part of the dark silver line right of way. There are two companion plans associated with this SUP request. Item 2B, as is shown on the screen, is a preliminary site plan showing the proposed improvements for the public service yard. Additionally, the property to the south of the SUP request is dedicating necessary parking and easements to the public service yard. These changes are reflecting on the revised preliminary site plan included in item 2C. The subject property is located in the employment center category of the future land use map of the comprehensive plan. The primary <coughs> uses of employment centers are corporate office campuses, medical centers, educational facilities, technology centers, and research facility. Limited manufacturing and warehouse uses may be allowed to support the employment centers. Staff finds the request for the public service yard consistent with the comprehensive plan. We receive no responses for this zoning case. Staff recommends approval of the SUP request subject to the restrictions listed on the screen and the approval of the companion preliminary site plan and revised preliminary site plan sub subject to the SUP approval. The applicant and their representative wish to address the commission with a presentation after the commission's questions from staff are concluded. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Sure. I'm looking at the board and I see Mr. Ratliff has a question. Just a clarifying question. One of your conditions is that the sound wall be constructed north of the public service yard. That's limited to where it's shown on the site plan. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. That was my only question. Thank you. Commissioner Carey, hope that answered his question as well. Any other questions for staff technical questions? Uh, oh, Mr. Ali. The condition on the sound wall, was that a condition brought up by staff? Was that given up by the applicant? Uh, how did that process go? The applicant volunteered to volunteered. install that sound wall. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Very good. Thank you, Ms. Malaj. Okay. I'll open the public hearing and we have the applicant. Yes, we have uh, Carl Crawley who would like to uh, present and Amy Matthews is available to answer questions. Thank you. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Carl Crawley, 2201 Main Street, Dallas, Texas, representing DART. I've got a lot of slides, but I'm not going to go through all of them, I promise. Unless Thank you. I really like to look at slides. It's a railroad. <laughs> <laughs> so I could, uh, is that enough? It's a railroad? Okay, we'll go a little further. Any questions for applicant on We'll go a little further. We'll go a little further. This is a maintenance facility. It's on the Silver Line. Um, as uh, Rahab mentioned, it, we're right next to the end of the line. The station is sort of next door to us. Um, at one point, there was consideration of moving this maintenance facility way up the DCTA line, way up north. And it's like there was an aha moment and go, wait a minute, I got, we've got a wide spot in the road here. <laughs> it literally, a wide spot in the railroad road. Um, seems to be a, a good place to put it. And also, obviously, at the end of the line, your trains usually end up at the end of the line. So... Um, You've got two requests, or three requests, basically, SUP, then the preliminary site plan, and the revised preliminary site plan. That building is being leased by DART at this time. Mm -hmm. That's where they'll end up having some of their maintenance facilities. The staff can be there, things of that nature. The reason for the revision is to um, codify of sorts where the fire lanes are and the access for fire emergency vehicles they'd have an access point to get to the rail line since there's now facilities there. Um, it's, it's a railroad, okay? Um, <laughs> I don't think we need to go further than that. Um, obviously, uh, these are the reasons we're here. There's a wide spot in the existing right-of-way. Um, 
The vehicles that will, are left there at night are, are not running. They are running, but they're plugged in, literally plugged in electricity, so they're not running diesel. These are mm -hmm. diesel uh, trains. It's not the light rail system. Mm -hmm. um, so that way they're not putting out fumes and they're not making that diesel. They're just literally plugged in like you're plugging in your, your car. Um, the, the question about the wall came up. Um, and I'll, when I get to another slide, I'll point out there is actually in that zoning across the way, a nursing home. You can see the classic spoke uh, of, of a nursing home, which is a residential use, which is non-conforming, I, I assume. And the, the sound wall will be placed in that area basically to buffer that area of the, of the track. And it was always in the plan. It's done separately to be done when the rail is improved, not, you know, so uh, we'll move on. You can't even see that, but that's a, that's a long, skinny piece of the track. Um, I'll go, there's a better slide. I'm going to the next one, if you don't mind. Um, that shows actually what we're building. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a train wash. Um, yeah, you pull your train in. <laughs> Mr. Ratliff and I were talking about, we hope there's not a guy saying go left or right. You better be on that track because right. you're pulling it in. The doors are closed. They wash it. They bring it on down the line. Um, Past that is the larger building is the actual maintenance facility building. Again, all indoors, um, the door on each end, they're closed, they do the maintenance work on it and they move it out. And then the last structure is a fueling canopy. It has a covered canopy. The storage tanks are underground to fuel the vehicles. Again, the preliminary site plan, you can sort of see this little hatched area next to the rail line. Those have been, were parking spaces that were removed. Um, we have the parking in place to, to cover our, our needs. Um, but those were removed to basically designate areas <laughs> so that uh, emergency it could have access to the buildings and everything. And then the sort of the shaded areas, the immortalizing or codifying the actual fire lanes um, for that use. Oh, there you go. There's your, uh, there's your spoke, your classic spoke of nursing home use. Shows the sound wall. Um, the, um, you can see the, the wash, uh, the canopy, um, and the maintenance buildings. These are actually the old, the original facility that we had planned to have was an open facility. Uh, and then working with staff and with use was, you can see now, and I'll move forward, <coughs> I'll go through these to get to the, that was again, as you can see, that was a canopy open facility. And now we're into the new facility, which has, um, I like this slide better, there. That shows actually the two access points from the revised, um, you can see one access point. You can see the maintenance building in the back, that's somebody bringing some fuel to the, to the underground fuel. But that's the, uh, the we're sitting in the actual uh, building that's being revised. And then there's a, a little sort of a close up you really can't see the tracks there, but there are tracks there. There's a door for the maintenance facility. You can see uh, the, the trains will all be fully enclosed. That's just a piece of equipment. And then the, the next thing past it is a canopy for where the fueling is done underneath the canopy. Again, there's the end of it. You can see the two tracks coming in and out. There's a, a door in the middle for equipment and, and people to come in and out. And then the trains will come out to two larger doors and then you can see the doors are closed. Um, if there's anybody working inside. An aerial view of the same situation. You can see then to still see the nursing home use in the background and the, and the sound wall. And again, I'm gonna go through these quickly, but lots of uh, renderings. That uh, building, I guess on the right there is actually the, I was gonna call it a car wash, the train wash facility. Track going in, the train pulls in, the car does, they wash it move it on down the line. So, and you can actually see there in between the two buildings as the train would go further down the line between the two buildings. Um, the, the, the trains are um, washed here, cleaned here overnight. Um, as as <laughs> Commissioner Ratliff said, that means yes, the, every train that leaves Plano will be a clean train. So <laughs> I don't think Carrollton can say that or, <laughs> or Richardson or, or Irving, yes, yeah. I don't think any of the, or cop, uh, actually it's in Dallas. There's a couple of stations in Dallas. I'm just gonna go through these. If you want me to stop, just let me know. There's a lot of computer graphics and stuff. 
Uh, so here's, here's where we are. We asked for approval of the SUP and the two site plans, the regular site plan and the revised site plan. Um, it's, it's a maintenance facility and a fueling facility and a washing facility for the Silver Line. Um, it's, as I mentioned, it's ideal location. It's a, a wide spot in the road. It's at the end of the line. The truck, the, the trains were gonna stop there at the end of the line. Anyway, it seems to make a logical place to have a maintenance facility there than some place that's not on the end of the line. Uh, two buildings and a canopy, that's it. All the, uh, all the noise related stuff or the, uh, the work related stuff is indoors, um, either the wash or the maintenance. The fueling is, is outside just because it's obviously it needs to be outside. Um, and then as, as I just mentioned, all, everything else will be inside. So um, I guess that, that's the last slide. There we go. I did go through them all, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, answer any questions. We have representatives of the engineers and DART and a whole lot of people that know a lot more about, about trains than I do. Although I've, I've, I've worked for DART for, as a consultant for 25 years, so I know a good bit. I was going to say, are you saying that they put you up there as a pretty face? Uh, no, that would, if they did, they made a big mistake, didn't they? Uh, <laughs> Maybe I'm the target. <clears throat> there, that's it. I'll, I'll be the target. All right, we'll move on. I don't think we have any speaker, other speakers on this, correct? No, we do not. Yeah, Commissioner Ali. I think you answered my question in your last statements, but this is going to be the end of the line anyway. So the vehicle movements um that we are implying your noise study was going to happen anyway it's not a causality of this particular sup correct right yeah and actually and actually i was sort of misleading the, the end of the line is actually just a little bit further down the tracks for the station if you can see there on the right side it's a little further down the tracks but for practical purposes it's the, the that station is the end so yes okay. thank you commissioner riley Thank you, Chairman. Um, just out of curiosity, how many jobs or is, is DART bring into Plano as part of this? Do you know? 65, a voice just put it in my ear. And, and I'm, I'm going to guess these are not short-term jobs. These people might be here a while. Uh, railroad workers usually stay for a while. Okay. Yeah. That's, that was my only question. Thank you for bringing them to Plano. Commissioner Tong. My question is related to the maintenance building. I understand you have a couple of other buildings in Dallas. Have you done a similar like a noise analysis on the maintenance building itself to, uh, because I feel like this nursing home is very, very <coughs> close to the maintenance building. Um, is the noise inside the building? Um, Contained inside the building? Right, right, right. <laughs> you read my mind. <clears throat> for, for yes, it is contained inside the building. All the noise. If if we're doing any any heavy lifting in there, and I, you know what I mean by heavy lifting, all that noise stays inside the building. Yes. Okay. Good answer. Thank you, Commissioner Bruno. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> the other commissioners know that I used to live in Irving one, once upon a time. But you found the. Well, found we, the right place to go to. Well, well, <laughs> while, I was, while I was in Irving, I had the honor to be part of a successful campaign in 1996 where Irving voted to stay in DART. There had, Thank you. Uh, Jerry Jones had sponsored a campaign to get Irving to vote out of DART, and we kept it in. He won the money first. I also had subsequently had the pleasure of serving as the Irving's representative to the major investment study that resulted in the routing of the Green Line to Carrollton and the Orange Line through Irving on its way to DFW Airport. And I am more than honored for the third time to be a part of a major event in the development of DART's mission to provide regional transportation to this area. Well, thank you. Uh, my question is, um, there is reference in the materials to access to the site for not only emergency vehicles, but also parking for the employees and staff, I guess. Does that run along the um, what looked to me like an abandoned uh, spur railroad track that sort of curves into the area? It's overgrown with weeds right now because it hasn't been used in a while, but that would seem to be a natural point of ingress. Well, the 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 egress, uh, I think I may have gone too far. There we go. Back, back, back. Sorry. Um, that one might work, uh, or that one actually. Stop. Yeah. Oh, the, the, either one. Um, the the employees will be 
in this building that is part of the revised site plan. And the egress points you can see right there actually where it connects um, to from that building to the rail line. So that's that's the employee connection in that situation. They would park mm -hmm. there and, and they probably have some work inside the building too, but if any work inside the, the track facilities, the maintenance facility and the wash, they're just literally gonna be able to walk from that building to the tracks. How did the uh, how would emergency vehicles get in? The the same the same way. And you yeah. can see on the screen there. There's actually a, a truck that's yeah. pulled through. But those are those two sort of portals that are there where the the fire lane is the red line. You can see there. But then it's it's paved all the way to the to the platform area. Not not a good term in rail because the platform is at a station. <laughs> but the uh, paved area around the maintenance facility. So that's how those vehicles would get to there. They would not have to come down the tracks or anything of that okay. nature. Now the staff is recommending approval with three conditions. I want to make sure that you're good with the three conditions. Two of them you've already referred to. One is the enclosed, fully enclosed building. The other one you've, it was the, uh, the, the sound wall on the north side. Yes. And the third one was necessary parking for the public service yard provided at the time of site plan review. Right. That's we're we're rearranging the parking in that uh, revised site plan portion of the request. Okay. So we'll have the parking there. The parking will not be in the rail line itself. Okay. Um, I'm very excited about the development of the Silver Line. I think it's a it's a big boon for the city of Plano, and I look forward to seeing it in operation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Law. There have been several references to this being the end of the line. It's really just the end of the line for Dart. Is that correct? Yes, yes, right. I'm Like sorry. the tracks keep going. Oh, yeah, tracks right. keep going. And this is a shared track, is that correct? So, like, the freight, the yeah. freight's going to continue to run. Yeah, yeah. Okay, just to they're be not gonna, right. They're not allowed in this part, though. Right. This they're is gonna, a DART facility. They're going to keep going by. I understand. And then lastly, in these slides, there's this sidewalk with people. Is there any... Maybe that's a staff question. There is a trail on the north side of the line, not part of this... This Are y'all building that, or is that just a future plan trail? No, that's part of the trail system. Yeah, that's that's being built. The hike and bike yeah. trail. It's on the net bike master plan. Very good. Thank you. Not master plan, but two words: master plan. <laughs> Mr. Raleigh. One clarifying question: the train wash, internal, external, in the tr the body of the train, and in the. They will clean the outside of the train, and they'll be cleaning the inside, vacuuming, picking up trash inside the train. Yeah. So it will really be the clean trains. The the, the clean, yeah, clean trains will be leaving Plano, or yeah, no, we may not arrive clean, but they'll leave clean. I don't see any other questions. Uh, thank you for your time here, Dark. Thank you. A good community partner for Plano. We appreciate you being here this evening. No other speakers. No, there are not. All right, I'm going to close the public hearing to find confined discussion to the commission. Speaker, microphone. Um, I'm ready to make a motion. Please do. I move that we approve item 2A uh, on condition that. Um, subject to the, staff's the, recommendations. The subject to staff's rec three recommendations, yes. I'll second. All right, we'll go with a motion by Commissioner Brunoff with a second by Commissioner Tong to approve item 2A subject to staff's recommendations. Please vote. That item carries eight to zero. Item 2B. Make a motion we approve item 2B subject to the approval of zoning case 2023-024. Second. Thank you. I have a motion by Commissioner Ratliff with a second by Commissioner Bronski to approve item 2B, subject to the approval of the zoning case. Please vote. Commissioner Tong. That item carries 8-0. Item 2C. I move we approve item 2C, uh, subject to the uh, approval of zoning case 2023-024. Uh, motion by Commissioner Bronski with a second by Commissioner Ollie to approve item 2C subject to the approval of the zoning case. Please vote. That item carries 8-0. Thank you again for your partnership. Have a great evening. Item 3. Agenda item number 3 is a replat. Williams High School Block 1, Lot 1R. 
public school on one lot on 25.2 acres located at the southeast corner of 18th Street and P Avenue. Zone single family residence seven. Applicant is Plano Independent School District. This is for administrative consideration. Good evening, commissioners. My name is John Kim, planner for the planning department. This item is recommended for approval as submitted. And I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Any technical questions for staff on this item? Right, thank you very much. Seeing none, I'll open the public hearing. Do we have any speakers on this item? No, we do not. Thank you. I'll close the public hearing to find discussion of the commission. Mr. Chairman, I move we approve item number three. I have, I have a motion by Commissioner Brunoff with a second by Commissioner Carey to approve item three as submitted. Please vote. Not item carries eight zero. Item four. Agenda item number four, preliminary replat. Legacy Town Center number two, block A, lots 3R and 4R. Hotel on lot 3R and professional general administrative office on lot 4R on 3.6 acres located at the northwest corner of Dallas North Tollway and Headquarters Drive. Zone plan development 65 Central Business 1 and located within the Dallas North Tollway Overlay District. Applicants are Plano Cabo Sparkles HQ3 LLC and Supreme Bright Plano 2 LLC. This is for administrative consideration. Please note, commissioners, that in the description, uh, there is an error that should read that located at the northeast corner of the Dallas North Tollway and Headquarters Drive. Uh, staff recommends this plan for approval subject to additions and or alterations as required to, to the engineering plant as required by the engineering department. I'm not happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions for staff on this side? All right. Thank you very much. Seeing none, I'll open the public hearing. Do we have any speakers on this side? No, we do not. Thank you. I will close the public hearing to find discussion of the commission. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Brunoff. I move that we approve item four, subject to additions and or alterations to the engineering plans as required by the engineering department. Second. Okay. I have a motion by Commissioner Brunoff with a second by Commissioner Bronsky to approve item four uh, as recommended by staff. Please vote. That item carries eight to zero. Item five. Agenda item number five is a preliminary replat. Plano Medical Plaza, Block 1, Lot 1R. Hospital and Medical Office on one lot on 41.0 acres, located at the northeast corner of Coit Road and 15th Street. Zone Plan Development 129 General Office. Applicant is Columbia Medical Center <coughs> of Plano Subsidiary, LLP. This is for administrative consideration. The item is recommended for approval subject to additions and or alterations to the engineering plans as required by the engineering department. And I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Any questions for staff on this item? All right. Thank you very much. I'll open the public hearing. Do we have any speakers on this item? No, we do not. Thank you. I'll close the public hearing, confine discussion to the commission. Mr. Ali. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move that we approve agenda item number five <coughs> subject to additions and alterations to the engineering plans as required by the engineering department. Second. Thank you. I have a motion by Commissioner Ali with a second by Commissioner Ratmuff to approve item five as recommended by staff. Please vote. That item carries eight to zero. Agenda item number six is a preliminary replat. Southwest 121 in Ohio edition, block one, lot six R. Restaurant with drive through on one lot on 0.5 acre located on the west side of Ohio Drive, 270 feet north of McDermott Road. Zoned regional commercial. Applicant is Pizza Hut of America Incorporated. This is for administrative consideration. Staff recommends this plan for approval subject to the additions and or alterations to the engineering plans as required by the engineering department. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Any questions for staff on this item? Thank you. 
I will open the public hearing. Do we have any speakers on this item? No, we do not. Thank you. I will close the public hearing to find discussion with the commission. Mr. Bronski. I move we approve this subject to additions and or alterations to the engineering plan as required by the engineering department. Thank you. Second. Okay. I have a motion by Commissioner Bronski with a second by Commissioner Ratliff to approve item six uh, as recommended by staff. And that item carries eight zero. Thank you. Non-public <laughs> hearing items. The presiding officer will permit limited public con comment for items on the agenda not posted for a public hearing. The presiding officer will establish time limits based upon the number of speaker requests, length of the agenda, and to ensure meeting efficiency and may include a total time limit. Agenda item number seven is discussion and direction. Direction, I'm sorry, discussion and direction regarding Article 21 residential adjacency standards of the zoning ordinance in the Planning and Zoning Commission work program. Applicant is City of Plano. This is for administrative consideration. Good evening, Commission. Uh, my name is Jordan Rockerby, Senior Planner with Development Services. So the commission requested a discussion item to be brought forward focused on the residential adjacency standards and their place within the commission work program. Um, this was at the September 5th meeting. The work program serves as a guide for future projects and is modified based on the direction received from the commission. Priorities may also change based on direction from city council or as required by legislative changes or market demands. There are several uh, zoning ordinance projects on the work plan which have either been recently completed or are in progress, including a complete rewrite of the zoning and subdivision ordinances. Review of the residential adjacency standards has been on the work program since at least 2014, and work was started in 2019, but it was paused due to the pandemic and prioritization of other projects on the work program. Review was unfolded into the scope of the larger rewrite, uh, consistent with Land Use Action 5 and the comprehensive plan to undertake a holistic review of adjacency standards found throughout the zoning ordinance. The residential adjacency standards were added to the zoning ordinance in 1999. The purpose was and continues to be to preserve and protect the integrity, enjoyment, and property values of residential neighborhoods. These standards are substantially the same today as they were when they were written in 1999 with only a handful of minor amendments, which uh, were outlined <coughs> in the packet you received. The residential adjacency standards are codified in Article 21 and Section 14.200 of the Zoning Ordinance and can generally be thought of in three basic parts. These are the land use tables, the review process, and the applied standards. Uh, the land use tables are pretty self-explanatory. There are 27 land uses in the zoning ordinance that are marked with an R in the non-residential district land use table. This R <coughs> means that the use is permitted subject to the procedures and standards found in Article 21. Uh, in the example on screen, the food truck park land use requires both a specific use permit and RIS review in the marked districts. Uh, Article 21 includes uh, the criteria for triggering this RIS review. Uh, first, the land use must be marked with an R in the preceding tables, and it must also be on a property within 150 feet of a residential district or 1,000 feet if a public address system is included within the proposal. There are some exceptions, such as if the property is separated by a type D or larger thoroughfare, or if the um, adjacent residential district has been developed with non-residential uses, with the exception of a public elementary school. If the proposal meets these criteria, <coughs> then the residential adjacency standards are applied during staff review of the site plan. I, I don't want to interrupt you, but can you go back one? Uh, yes. You said certain uses on properties within 150 feet or 1,000 feet and then I couldn't understand. Oh, what. sorry. If there is a public address, a public address system, so a PA system. A public address system. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Keep going. Yeah, so it's, um, as has been mentioned in a, a previous case, the RIS are focused on noise, yeah. so it would be um, outdoor speakers. Yeah, all right, thank you. I just didn't catch that yeah, no public worries. address system. Go ahead. I know I'm moving quick. <laughs> yes, I understand. Uh, the last piece of the residential adjacency standards are the actual applied standards. Um, 
these standards apply to specific land uses and structures that may pose a nuisance to neighboring residential districts. Uh, it's important to note that not every land use marked with an R in the land use table has an explicit accompanying standard. Um, as an aside, there are many other land uses in the zoning ordinance which have similar adjacency standards which are not found in Article 21. Uh, predominantly, these are in Article 15, the use-specific regulations. The key difference is in the name. Uh, use-specific standards reply, apply only to the named land use, whereas the residential adjacency standards apply to any use marked with an R. Uh, there are several known issues uh, with the residential adjacency standard that should be addressed through the future review. Uh, foremost is that the residential adjacency standards only apply to land uses marked with an R in uh, those land use tables, and that measurement is based on distance from a residential district. This is difficult to administer as the complexity of the zoning ordinance has changed since 1999, <coughs> and development no longer reflects the binary residential and non-residential district structure. Interpretation of the standards can also be difficult when a use is marked with an R but does not have a clearly applied standard uh, in Article 21. And finally, undefined or imprecise language becomes a point of argument in how these standards should be applied. Uh, to summarize, the residential adjacency standards are intended to protect neighborhoods from certain um, offensive or nuisance land uses. There are known issues with the interpretation and application of these standards, but these issues are neither critical nor easily isolated from uh, the zoning ordinance. Review and updates to the residential adjacency standards are planned as part of the larger um, rewrite, and staff see value in this holistic approach within the rewrite project and do not see need to separate the residential adjacency standards back out as a standalone project. Uh, staff is seeking the commission's direction on these two questions, which are also found in your packet, and recommend that the commission provide direction regarding the residential adjacency standards and their priority within the commission work program. That concludes my presentation. Happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. There are several comments. Um, uh, I'm going to ask one first, and I, I looked on here, and maybe I'm missing it. Um, Let's see. I was looking for our work program in terms of that prioritization uh, list. Uh, for example, <clears throat> uh, do we have something that lists, all right, what are we working on right now? What are we targeted to work on next month and the month after that? And uh, again, if it's in here, I, I missed it. Oh, it's right there. Okay, maybe that's where I need to be. So, and this is just me, I guess, from a standpoint of um, understanding a little bit. So I'm looking at right now, <clears throat> Exhibit A, uh, Community Design Plan in progress, priority is high. And then we got short-term rentals is high, sign ordinance, silver line, zoning and subdivision ordinance. <coughs> Those are medium, but they're currently in progress, right? Okay. Uh, Short-term rentals, signs, and silver line are all marked as high priority. Right, and, and they're also part of the in-progress section, right? Correct, as are um, number five and six on your <coughs> list, the zoning right. and subdivision ordinance rewrite and priority policy documents. Right. And then pending on hold, we've got update of commission antenna ordinance, and then future items, we've got high, and then medium and low, and then we have active cases that we're currently working on. Um, I guess the, the thing that I'm looking at on here is that it tells us it's a high priority item. Can I see somewhere, anywhere on here that says, here's our target for addressing this. Here's our target date for bringing this to the commission or our target date for asking for input. Or is that not something we're going to see on here? It's just something you guys have internal somewhere. Yeah, that's something that staff manages as... As, as situation change. Right, exactly. So you know, this is the commission's priorities, and we bring them forward as soon as we can, uh, balance with other priorities. Okay. And, and other actions outside of, like this is the commission's work program, there, there are other priorities for the department beyond these that sure. are also being worked on. Sure, understood. And these were developed from the 
the uh, subcommittees that we pulled out and we identified in those which ones were high priority, which ones were medium, correct? So this work plan has been, I don't know when it was created, but it's been in effect for a while. Um, the subcommittee work was specific to those obsolete plans right. to remove those, which is listed on here as, as, a, <clears throat> as a line item. But the work plan as, as a whole, staff brings back periodically for the commission to comment, do you want to change priority? Is there things to add or remove? And but some of these items came about, or some of the items that were on our subcommittee lists kind of got rolled into some of these items, Correct. right? Because Correct. we were sunsetting at something, but we felt like there were two or three pieces of it that still needed to be added to the overall comprehensive plan or updated. So. Correct. So an example would be the private street subdivision guidelines was one that was reviewed. It was tacked on to the uh, thoroughfare standards update. Yes. And that work, work, or work item, work. We've Sorry. done our job there and it's moved Work on. program item, yes, it was listed there. It's since been completed. It's now teched in under the completed items. Okay. So ultimately, the staff has looked at residential adjacency standards and said, yes, it's part of what we're reworking as part of getting all of our ordinance kind of aligned with the overall comprehensive plan. But there's nothing currently driving a need to pull that out as a separate high priority project in staff's opinion. Ms. Sebastian can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it used to be a separate item. It's since been consolidated into the zoning ordinance rewrite. Several line items have been consolidated into that one line item. Okay, <coughs> you're nodding. I just, you were leaning forward, so I was oh, waiting on you to speak. I, that, that's correct. Um, many of them used to be their own line items, but as we got closer to getting the rewrite going, uh, we realized we just need, we would approach them more holistically and address them all together as part of the rewrite. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, so we have the questions in front of us. Uh, first off, and I'm gonna go to Mr. Ratliff uh, and we'll just work our way through the deals. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just in looking at, reading the memo, it, it occurred to me that you're gonna be looking at the residential adjacency standards as part of the zoning and subdivision ordinance rewrite, obviously, right? That's correct. Is it fair to assume that, or to if we if we accelerated just the residential adjacency standards, you would effectively be doing that work twice because we'd have to coordinate it with today's zoning and subdivision ordinance, followed by coordinating it again with the new one. Is that that would be a reasonable assumption that we okay. would need to first fit it into our existing ordinance today. And then once we start on the rewrite, we would be looking at not only everything that is in the zoning ordinance at, the, at that time, but then how that interacts with you know, where we're going with the new one. So as mentioned, the residential adjacency standards in Article 21, those aren't the only adjacency standards that we have in our ordinance. Staff feel that it is best looking at all of those standards holistically, seeing how they work with each other, and that's starting to get a very large scope um, as opposed to just zeroing in on Article 21. So the question in my mind then is not, do we ask you to break out this part of the project and do it faster? It's a question of, do we ask you to do it twice? Is that, is that am I, over, am I over, oversimplifying it? I think we would, until we engage with the future consultant and work through how drastic of a change our rewrite is going to be. We won't know the scope of how much is going to change in the rewrite. Um, so it's difficult to answer if we'll be doing the exact same work twice, but um, it is a potential um, danger that we would be duplicating work. Okay, uh, that, that's the way I was reading it. So thank you for confirming that for me. So thank you, that was my only question. Commissioner Brodsky. So I've got, a. Uh... I've got a technical question on pages four and five of uh, the document where it talks about uh, other residential adjacency standards. It gives you that little uh, box that goes on two pages. And uh, this may be me nitpicking, but I'm curious. So for heliports, we use the word school, but then we go down to private clubs uh, the first one, we give a 300-foot setback for private, 
I'm sorry, for public or parochial schools, but not private schools? So this is one of the reasons why we're going down this rewrite path is we're dealing with an ordinance that dates back to the 80s and it has been patched up many times. Yeah, so the my, language it, is not always consistent from it, use to use. It seemed very confusing to have the 300 foot setback for public and parochial schools and then a thousand foot setback for private schools. That kind of struck me as odd. And so, yeah, I mean, uh, and then going down to the tattoo parlor, I actually thought we had cleaned that up so that it did include but nonetheless, that's my only thing is I'd like us to make sure we're all encompassing when it comes to uh, each of these schools and treating everybody equally and fairly. Uh, and the verbiage for the heliport makes more sense than some of the more complicated verbiage that we include in other places. My only comment, thank you. All right, Commissioner Brunoff. Uh, whoops, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Oop, mic is off. There you go. <sighs> okay. <laughs> the clock says it's 925. No. I know it's only 825, but it feels I'm just, I'm just conditioned like to <laughs> thinking the red light means no, and I yeah. think, okay. Uh, <laughs> um, in the year that I've been on the commission, I've had to deal with only one case involving a residential adjacency standard. Actually, two, because tonight there was one. So before tonight, there was only one that I remember, and that was the tattoo parlor in Russo Village. And in that case, the commission had the authority to shorten the required separation distance if we thought a shorter distance would be adequate to protect the residential, the adjacent residential properties. So it strikes me that as long as we have that authority to make an exception if the circumstances warrant it, that there would be nothing in the way of urgent circumstances that would require you to want to address a rewrite of residential adjacency standards immediately as a separate item because we can always control the impact of what we do on the, on the adjacent residences by utilizing the authority we have to vary the distance if we have to. Okay? Now, uh, do you disagree with that? Are you aware of any sort of urgent circumstances that we need to do something right now with the residential adjacency or would, is the staff of the opinion that it would, uh, the most efficient way to handle it is, is as part of the larger rewrite of the zoning and subdivision ordinance. For sure, so I guess there's, uh, I'll have two pieces of an answer. Um, yeah. The first regarding tattoo studios, so those yeah. aren't part of the residential adjacency standards, that's the use specific standards. Okay. Um, they don't fall under the RIS. Um, under the residential adjacency standards, um, there's, a couple uses that are called out, and it's it shall not be located within X feet mm -hmm. of a residential district. There's no wiggle room on those. It's an absolute. There's others where okay. it's this is permitted with sufficient screening as determined by the commission. So those ones you do still continue to have uh, some uh, discretion on. In terms of the second half of the question of do staff feel that um, it's an urgent issue. Um, I would say, no, this is not one of our daily pain points. We don't have to argue these every day. It's not causing um, holdups in any of our application reviews, which is why we're not recommending that it be uh, pulled out from the rewrite. Okay, do you think that residential properties are sufficiently protected in the interim under the current state of the ordinances while you work on the larger rewrite? So in the interim, um, the RAS protect residential districts yeah. where it becomes difficult as the interpretation of how that applies to our mixed use districts. So <laughs> CV1, UMU, and whether or not um, those residences are uh, equally protected. I'm not sure you answered my question. Um, are we, uh, are you content to go with the presence of the present structure while you work on the larger rewrite rather than have to pull out the residential adjacency standards for an immediate, uh, for an immediate revision. I, th I think as, as they are now, as, as Mr. Rockerby said, it's, it's not a, a major pain point for us. And the, <coughs> the way that they've been interpreted since 99, um, these, the intent is to protect residences. 
and we we feel that that is that is okay. happening with All the right. implementation so of these. Based on that, I think that it should be handled as part of the larger the rewrite program and not handled separate. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Commissioner Ali. Just have a question. Um, 2014 to 2019 was this high priority, low priority, medium priority. It just strikes me as odd that this is on a work program for five years and this, what movement happened in that time? <laughs> I think we're Lawsuits, comprehensive plan committees, ah. COVID, um, <laughs> short term rentals. <laughs> Yeah, no, it, it's, it's staff is very much looking forward to the to the rewrite happening. I think it's on the her, very near horizon, perhaps as soon as next quarter that we initiate this process. We're very excited to get it started. Okay, just curious. Commissioner Law. Uh, maybe I'm remembering this incorrectly, but I believe it was my comments at the September 5th meeting that sparked this. And I just want to let the commission know my comments were related very specifically to the site plan at the Home Depot. It got recorded as bringing this back as part of the work program, which was not my intent. My intent was to look at how this was applied at a very specific location. And so I too think that the question to answer number one is we don't need to separate it out. That was Eric's recommendation to us, okay. not what I was actually requesting. Now, we've been educated on how my concerns can or cannot go forward, and that's a different issue. But I don't have concerns about the residential adjacency standards. I had concerns about how they were, they were applied in a specific situation, and that's now a separate issue. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Tong. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think that my question is specifically related to what Mr. Lyo just said, is that I... Maybe this should help to help me understand how this works because I realize that the residential uh, adjacency standards are uh, being applied to certain types of properties and certain types of zoning uh, categories. And those are already identified by the, the, the letter R. But how are these identified? How were they identified? And when were they when were they identified? Uh, are we supposed to review those before we review the standards themselves? So um, everything that's currently marked with an R, with the exception of the um, the food truck yards, food truck courts, um, all of those were marked with an R um, back in 1999. Um, and they continue to be marked with an R today. The only two changes were um, uh, drive-in restaurants were added in 2001, and then the, the food trucks were added um, in whenever that was, 2013. Um, but other than that, all of the um, other 25 land uses were marked with an R in 1999. OK. Thank you for identifying the, the time. Uh, do we even know how were they identified? Did, did, are we just identifying them one at a time when they happens when they happen, or how how were they identified? How would I know that this is a specific use that I have to apply RHS on it? So I, I think you're asking the right question. It's just it would be a question that would be asked when we go through this process. And tonight <coughs> we're just trying to determine: Do we want that to be a high priority project or not? As part of that rewrite, we'll have this opportunity to, one, get a little history on how were they developed, when were they developed, how were they applied, and now how do we incorporate these use-specific setbacks uh, of standards with a general overall uh, residential adjacency standard mm -hmm. in the ordinance. Mm -hmm. So I think the question tonight is, is it a high-priority project or just part of our standard work program? That's all we're really trying to determine tonight. Uh, yeah, I personally think that's probably should be. A, that's why I asked the question because I think it's a part of the the whole rewrite. It cannot be separated from the other parts right. of the uh, standards or the ordinance. Okay, uh, Commissioner Kerry. Yeah, I mean, uh, as I look through the documents you guys put forth, I mean, there's clearly some need for for some work here. You know, there's different measures that need consistency, and developers are interpreting them differently. 
Um, with that said, I think uh, this project has already been included in, in the zoning rewrite, correct? Mm -hmm. it's, it, I think that's what we that's, said. That's right? correct. It will be part so, of the rewrite. So there is motion that way. As I understand it, um, that is somewhat contingent on us hiring a subcontractor to work this through with us. Um, is that accurate? Yeah. So our, I guess currently um, we are still in the selection process for our consultant. And as uh, Mr. Bell mentioned, we could be looking at a kickoff sometime in first quarter of next year. Yeah. Um, but yes, we're currently still uh, selecting. Um, yeah. And, and so since the, the, the task here is to give you guys direction, I'll give you mine. Um, I, I think that, you know, as the fellow commissioners have said, uh, this doesn't seem to be super urgent. It, I think the important thing is, to, as, as Commissioner Tong said, is to get this right. And so it probably all should be dovetailed in there. I guess the one thing that caused me just a little bit of pause is the, the comment in the documents that said, if, in fact, we wanted to look at this more urgently, it would cause us potentially to delay and other projects may suffer, I think, were the words that were used. And, I, and so I just wonder, um, gosh, do we need to, and maybe this is beyond the purview of this commission and more for city council, but does this team need some help out there? And, and I think <laughs> that's really the issue I want to talk about, is do we need to f find a way to give the team more help? Because if we do this, other things will suffer. And for you know, a city that's got as many things going on as we do, I feel like maybe you guys or under the gun. And I think recently I heard a comment that maybe the team is short staffed. And so I guess my plea is really, yes, I think you guys, this is right. Do this the way you're doing it. But um, how, how do we take a look at how we maybe get this team some more um, help? So with that, I'm done. Just for staff's notice, um, Mr. Carey loves Chewies, so gift cards to the Chewies <laughs> is acceptable. I've already got them. <laughs> He's already got them. This didn't happen by accident. Yeah, understood. Okay. <laughs> all right. I think I think the 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 response to all of this is do not separate it. Uh, even as Mr. Law said, that wasn't his intent originally, but that's where it wound up. So thank you for bringing it tonight. We'll roll it into the rewrite of the entire ordinance, um, and then as far as updates to the work program, unless you can hire a bunch more people real quickly, we'll just continue on the path we're on. So thank you for that. Thank you. Okay. Um, I don't think there's a, any of you guys want to address us on this issue. It's not a public hearing, but she'll yell at me if I don't at least offer it to. Uh, I would like Bell. to make just one comment. I think the commission's goals and staff goals are perfectly aligned. It's, it's our goals to provide protections for our residents. We do that every day, even if there are not residential adjacency standards applied. Right. You can hear the conversations we have about moving dumpsters away and things that aren't required. It happens on a daily basis. And so to some degree, we're asked to um, explain an ordinance that we didn't write, um, and we would welcome the opportunity to get the chance to work with that, work through those with you in the rewrite. Thank you. Okay. Microphone. Like tonight in our conversation about residential adjacency standards on item, I think it was one and two, one and two you made a distinction between a business association and a land use association. And so where, if, if we want to understand that more, or if I do, what is the best, like, I don't want to make it a future agenda item. Do I come to you privately and ask, but if I want the whole commission to know, is that your job to take to them? What's the best way to. Yeah, there's a number of ways we could do it. Um, staff's happy to provide a memo as a starting place to explain it, if that's helpful. Okay, explaining those. Um, you know, I think there's some terms thrown around that have very specific meanings from zoning. Use is one. So, activity is a different one. Exactly. Use, use has a very distinct meaning. <coughs> activity is not defined, right? So, we know what use means. And so, there are examples of that where I think maybe helping explain the way staff looks at certain words would help you understand the way it's being interpreted um, through the site planning process. So, what I understand is that I would ask you the question and then if you think it's worthy you would send a memo to other folks we're happy to provide the memo to everyone so they have the same information okay thank you okay are we done with item seven all right thank you okay uh, item. Agenda item number eight is discussion and action election of first and second vice chairs 
Okay. Mr. Uh, Chairman. Uh, boy, you're, you're, yeah. uh, let me, let me one second here. Uh, first, I wanted to say, uh, I, I was honored to be selected again to chair it. Uh, I, I appreciate the passion that every single one of you bring to this dais. Uh, and, and in every case, what I hear first and foremost is how do we protect our citizens? How do we protect our residents? Right. Uh, second to that is how do we create a good business atmosphere? So I appreciate Appreciate all of you for that, and I appreciate the liaisons uh, appointing me to this position again. Um, that being said, the item is pretty clear. We're going to do our elections. I think last year we had great discussions around that, the process even, clarified that a little bit. And so uh, with that being said, I will now turn to Mr. Bruno. Thank you. Um, I second your comments. Uh, it's an honor to serve on the commission under your chairmanship. Um, I also would like to say that I believe our first and second vice chairs over the past year have performed admirably to the extent they've been called upon to perform. And uh, I would like to see them continue in their present roles, so I would like to nominate Commissioner Carey as to continue as first vice chair and Commissioner Ratliff to continue as uh, second vice chair. Okay. So, yeah. Well, there's, all right. So under the rules, we don't have a motion and a second anymore, really. We're just gonna open the floor up for nominations. And right now we have a nomination for Commissioner Carey as vice chair and Commissioner uh, Ratliff as second vice chair. Uh, Commissioner Ali. Might be messing up the process a little bit. Um, echo Commissioner Bruno's comments on um, being happy that you got reappointed um, to chair. Um, Would, pro would want to move two different nominations, um, Commissioner Ratliff uh, to first vice chair, and going back to um, the nominations last year, I actually want to nominate Commissioner Bronski to second vice chair, um, as I believe his guardianship of and the fidelity to the comprehensive plan is something that has served this body well. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Commissioner Long, you're... I would echo Mr. Brunoff's uh, sentiment that first vice chair and second vice chair that are currently in their roles are doing a good job, and if it was up to me, I would leave it alone. Okay. Uh, so right now we have two, are there any other nominations? Does anyone else want to make nominations? Nope. Okay. So why don't we start maybe with uh, the uh, first vice chair. And so we have a, a nomination for Commissioner Carey. We have a nomination for Commissioner Ratliff. Do either of you want to say anything? Nope. Okay. And, and if this is not a deal. We'll just do a hand vote here. Um, I, my personal opinion is... Uh, having served on the commission before, is, there's always been this rotation in the leadership just to give everybody chances to serve. Um, I've been in that position where I was first on the PNZ, I was vice chair one year, and then the next year I, I was a nobody. <laughs> and it was okay, it's just the way it worked. But uh, anyway, all right, so let's, um, let's vote on that, I guess. And for vice chair, if you're in favor of uh, Commissioner Carey continuing to serve in that role. Please raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Um, that's the majority of the body. So in this case, congratulations, Mr. Carey. You will now serve as the first vice chair. It's my honor. Thank you. Yep. All right. And then uh, for second vice chair, we have uh, Commissioner Ratliff. And those in favor of Commissioner Ratliff continuing to serve as the second vice chair, please raise your hand. And that item carries, you're not voting for yourself. He's abstaining. <laughs> so that item carries uh, six to two. So congratulations, Mr. Ratliff. You are the second vice chair again. Uh, well, he abstained, so. Oh, you abstained as well. All right, so we have six in favor and two abstentions. There we go. All right, very good. All right, uh, thank you for that. Last item would be new business. For the record, I was abstaining on your road as well. 
<laughs> oh, okay. There we go. Not an against. Um, all right. Agenda item number five is items for future agendas. And then item number nine, future agenda. Anything? Okay. We are adjourned at 845.